So I'll just go ahead and get started here. Um, my name is Morgan Hayes. Um, Josh Jackson is uh, standing here next to me. Um, we are um, uh, in the Ag and Biosystems Engineering Department here. Um, and we're just trying a series uh, on Wednesdays, early Wednesdays in the month uh, this semester um, with some different topics relating to cattle facilities primarily, uh, and then one on energy use in barns in general. Um, and um, thanks for coming. Uh, we appreciate all of you signing up. Um, the first one today is cow-calf confinement, spacing, and ventilation. Um, this topic I think is pretty interesting. Um, before coming uh, here about a year and a half ago, I was in Illinois, um, and before that I was in Nebraska. Uh, and before that I was in Iowa. So I've been in the Midwest probably for the last 10 years or so. Um, and this cow-calf confinement concept is really coming out of the Iowa, Nebraska sort of area. Um, and there are some things about it that I think really work well uh, and, and transfer well into Kentucky. And I think there are some concerns. Uh, and I'll try and target where some of the information is and where it came from uh, and how it might relate uh, in uh, in Kentucky versus what we're probably hearing from um, Midwestern uh, construction groups, the hoop barn folks and, and groups like that. Um, anyway, I need to start the slide set. So I thought I'd start today with uh, why confinement, um, talking a little bit about uh, types of confinement, spacing needs, the facility and ventilation concerns, and then just some final thoughts um, on confinement for cow-calf pairs in general. Um, so why uh, confinement? Um, land availability and price, I think, is the largest driver um, nationally. Um, people are looking to potentially bring back a family member onto the farm uh, or diversify a farm. Uh, and they can't pick up land close enough uh, or for the right price uh, that they can actually justify the cost on a barn uh, as an alternative. Um, a lot of people that I hear that come in with an idea of putting up a barn are concerned about mud in calving season in March or February. Uh, and around here, that's a huge issue. Um, less so if you go into some of the other states, but the problem with using it as a maybe a, a part-time confinement in order to manage mud issues is, is costing out the structure. Um, some people are utilizing older structures, uh, retrofitting, um, and for that there might be an easier justification cost-wise. Um, but mud is one of those tricky things where uh, if you only want to use it to manage mud, it's, it's a challenge uh, to economically justify it. Um, drought. Uh, so a lot of the Western states, um, Texas actually was probably one of the first promoters of this in the 2012 type of drought season. Uh, a lot of people looked um, at that drought situation and they said the only way we can get our animals fed is to buy feed and put them in a barn. Um, that way our land isn't being destroyed um, and we can feed them more efficiently uh, and perhaps limit feed um, and get the diets right so that they can maintain body weight and, and still rebreed uh, without um, the cost on hay. Um, uh, they can use some alternative ingredients. Um, a lot of people like the efficiency in the feed management. Um, if you have a low cost ingredient in your area, um, you can really start to streamline feed costs on the cow. Um, but uh, around here, I don't see a lot of people targeting that as their primary objective, um, but it's certainly something to consider. Uh, if you move animals into a barn, they're not moving as much. Uh, limit feeding tends to be an appropriate option. Um, there's also a lot of people interested in it from a reproductive management. People that are doing a lot of AI work or embryo transfer, they have a lot of high dollar cows and they really wanna manage the reproduction. Uh, and ensure that the calf comes out alive and that they are on hand to, to manage that calf to make sure they don't lose calves. Um, there's definitely some, some opportunities there as well. 
Uh, and like I said before, some people are looking at this as an expansion. Um, some people are looking at it starting from scratch. I would never recommend putting cow calf pairs into a barn if you're not an experienced cow calf operator. Um, just because of the, the intense, intensive practices and the disease issues, uh, if you're not already familiar with what a calf looks like healthy, it's really hard uh, to come into a barn like this and really manage those calves. Um, but some people are interested in it that way because they aren't able to pick up a large plot of land and this is how they think uh, they'll get into the cattle market. Uh, confinement options. I just I just throw this out there because a lot of people assume when I say confinement that I, I mean a barn, and I, I do in this case mean a barn, um, but dry lots are also an option. Uh, and some people will, if they can't justify the cost of a barn, put animals on what they would consider a sacrificial lot or a dry lot, basically a lot that doesn't maintain vegetation. Uh, this is where we have real mud issues uh, in this state. Um, so it's sort of important to keep that in the back of your mind that that is also confinement um, if those cows are in a real small space uh, and there's not vegetation there. Um, some people are doing seasonal confinement versus year round. Um, we see more seasonal confinements um, out west where they're grazing um, uh, bean stubble or uh, corn after they've uh, been through the field. Um, so where they're grazing crop ground basically. Uh, and then other times of the year, they're bringing them into the barn um, for efficiency sake. Um, it's not a bad option, um, but it is a little bit harder to manage to keep weights right and to, to make sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, a lot of people are looking at year round cow groups in a barn. Uh, the other thing we see some people considering doing is having two calving seasons and then having one group come in for calving and then having the second group come in for calving. So six months in the barn and six months out on pasture. So only the group uh, calving uh, and then for that calf until it's about four or five months old and they wean the calf uh, and then they turn the other group into the barn before the second group calves. Sort of an interesting option to maybe get a little bit uh, higher percentage of the calves coming in the barn um, from a management standpoint. Um, but there are some disease issues with that as well. So certainly people are thinking about using these barns in different ways. Um, and not that any of them is wrong, but, but all of them have some different dynamics to them. So sort of something to keep in the back of your mind. <clears throat> there are sort of three types of barns uh, that I see people looking at. Uh, the first is the hoop barn. Uh, the hoop barn is really probably the concept that pushed cow-calf confinement forward. Um, realistically, uh, building costs on a hoop barn are maybe $15 a square foot. Um, they're fairly inexpensive, um, but if we live in an area where we have some local builders and we don't have a lot of uh, regulation on construction, um, we could probably get a Mennonite group or somewhere, someone like that around around us to build for about the same cost on a gabled structure, a wood gabled structure. Um, so similar to uh, this picture down here on the bottom, this is a metal gabled structure. It's obviously a dairy barn, but, but that concept of an open barn uh, with a, a gable is um, pretty enticing around here, as long as the ridge fence right and the eaves are right. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people are constructing buildings like this uh, without any engineering design on them. Um, and so if you have a producer interested in putting up a gabled structure, I think it's really important um, that you make sure that they're, they're really clear on what they want and that they have a good design uh, plan coming from somewhere um, that has been sort of vetted. Um, and the third type of barn, and this is what we see a lot in the Midwest <coughs> is the monoslope. Uh, monoslopes really are much more popular with um, feeder cattle uh, for finishing operations out west, um, but people are also looking at them um, for cow-calf. Um, my challenge with uh, this barn is that it, the uh, weather patterns here aren't quite ideal for it. 
Uh, when we get into the ventilation, we'll talk a little bit about uh, how air moves and, and some of the issues with them. But the monosloop moves a lot of air. So people do like that design. I think it's important uh, that we recognize that that design comes out of the upper Midwest um, and it works extremely well there. And there's a lot of data that, that shows that it works extremely well there. Uh, but the data doesn't really come from here. So uh, the other question we should be asking a producer if they're thinking about putting in a barn is um, what animals are going to be confined? Um, are you going to confine the dry cows, the cows at calving, the cows with the calf on their side? Are you going to keep calves in the barn and move cows out uh, to try and background the cows for certain months of the year? Uh, or are you going to keep the cows in and move the calves out to try and background the calves? Uh, are you going to sell at weaning? Um, having a plan going forward might make a difference in how you design the space. Um, so that's sort of a, an interesting thing to have a discussion about with the producer pretty early on. Um, spacing. This is a fun one. Um, from a dry lot perspective, um, we get a lot of people that are interested in um, putting in a dry lot sort of situation, putting animals into a sacrificial lot. Um, and there's a lot of data out there about dry lots um, for cows, for cows with calves, for calves alone. Um, the problem is that the average rainfall where all these recommendations come from has half of the annual rainfall totals, um, which is why dry lots for cows don't work here in Kentucky. Um, the mud levels here just overwhelm the system. Um, it's hard to get drainage here. That's a viable option for, for a dry lot or for a sacrificial lot. Um, and some people think that they can add a dry lot area next to a barn. Uh, and again, then they run into the same issue that they had uh, with their winter lots to begin with. Um, so certainly something to keep in mind. Um, so when we look at barn spacing, there's very little data on a bedded barn. Um, for cows with the calves on their side, 80 to 120 square feet is an Iowa State slash industry recommendation. Um, and when I first started looking at this data, there's almost nothing to back up this data other than trial and error. Um, that number includes creep area for the calves. Um, and it's not a, a bad number, but it's really driven by space at the feed bunk, by the, the width of the um, uh, hoop barns that are most common in that area. They end up actually assigning the square footage to match that. Excuse me. And so I just want to just, just make sure people understand these numbers are industry driven. They work in the Midwest. Uh, but they're not precisely what we need here. They're a little bit short. Um, we should be at the very top end of that number, plus a little bit probably. Um, for dry cows, uh, Midwest Plan Service gives us 25 to 30 square foot um, per cow, and NRCS gives a dry dairy cow number of 40 square foot. Um, those numbers are for a bedded barn, not a compost bedded pack barn. So these numbers are reflecting if you are adding bedding to maintain the proper uh, footing uh, texture, um, but they don't really uh, give us an input on how much bedding it's gonna cost uh, to make this work. This is just about if the animal can be healthy if the barn is maintained properly. Um, and it's pretty tight. I mean, for us here with bedding costs where they're at, this would not be a cost-effective stocking density. Um, but a lot of people will start if they have a full barn that they're gonna calve in with the cows close up and they'll only give them a portion of the barn. And then as calves come in, they'll start moving them into the other portion of the barn. Uh, and I think it is true that we can sort of tighten up the space with just the cows um, and keep some of the bedding area dry until the calves come. So that is an option. Um, the number for calves after weaning, 20 to 25 square foot from Midwest Plan Service and 25 uh, from NRCS. Um, these numbers I think are sort of important. Um, 
because a lot of people are thinking they're going to keep the calves after the cows, uh, you know, are weaned, the calves are weaned off of the cows. Um, but they need to anticipate that that's only a portion of the barn. So really costing out that barn space, if they're going to keep the calves in the barn to feed them, say over the summer when the cows go back out on pasture, um, might not be, they might not make as much money as they could. And then people tend to instinctively want to buy extra calves to put in the barn uh, to utilize the space. And then they bring diseases into their barn. Um, so there's really some issues sort of with that balancing act um, and bringing in calves out of, out of a stockyards and putting them into the barn where you're going to then calve again in six months. A lot of diseases can be managed in that six month period, but there are some that really stick. Uh, and if that bedding's not being removed before those cows go back on, uh, there can be issues with that. Um, a lot of, a lot of people uh, and a couple companies have suggested that slatted flooring is an option. And I'm going to say that I think slatted floors for cow calf pairs is a terrible option. Um, basically dry cows um, on a slatted floor need about 20 square foot uh, and calves need 10 to 15. Those are pretty tight numbers from the Midwest. Um, but I think they are accurate. We don't have a manure issue. Uh, we have a higher dollar manure um, and they will work. Putting cows onto slatted floors, I think there's some issues with feet, uh, legs, um, things like that. Um, but, you know, it's not a terrible option for a cow or a calf. Unfortunately, um, if we look at the, the slat sizing that we need for a calf and the slat sizing we need for a cow, they're not the same. Uh, in order for the slats to work for a cow, we need an inch and a half. Um, sort of spacing on those slats. Um, and on, on the calves, if we have an inch and a half spacing, their, their hooves will get caught in those slats. Um, so putting in a slatted floor is really not a good idea for cow-calf pairs. Um, some people will tell you that the value of the manure or something like that uh, might justify it, um, but I would suggest that calves really don't belong on slats that are built for cows. Um, for the compost bedded pack uh, barns, uh, this is a pretty popular concept. Um, it comes through the dairy group here in the state has done a lot of work. Uh, a lot of the beef producers are interested in it. The value of the compost bedded pack barn means we can reduce our bedding numbers because we're driving moisture off of our pack through the composting process. Um, if we look at moisture numbers and characteristics of um, a beef cow's manure versus a dairy cow's manure, we come up with about 85 square feet of compost bedded pack area per cow to keep minimal bedding additions in the summer. Um, and that 85 square feet doesn't sound too bad considering that 80 to 120 number that we were seeing um, out of um, Iowa State. but um, by the time we add in the additional area that they need to have in the feed alley and potentially a creep area, we're at at least 125 square feet per cow-calf pair. Uh, realistically, we probably even want to be a little bit higher than that um, because we're, we're driving for a dry barn. At the end of the day, um, our goal when we put a calf into a barn is to keep the calf dry in order to keep the calf healthy. Um, so that moisture management is critical. Uh, and if we go too tight on space, um, we will lose control of the barn so fast that we'll end up with uh, disease issues that we can't keep up with. Um, when we look at the barn, a lot of times the design decisions are made based on feed bunk uh, and water spacing. Um, and that feed bunk spacing is really critical. Um, cows need uh, 24 to 36 linear inches per head at the feed bunk. Uh, with a highlighted note there that by 90 days of age, calves can eat 1% of their body weight in forage. So if we're feeding at a feed bunk and we have a cow-calf pair in there, the cow needs 24 to 36 inches and the calves are gonna be starting to eat almost immediately, investigating what's in that bunk. Uh, and they're gonna go on to feed extremely quickly um, if they're in a barn with their mothers. Um, 
what we don't want is those calves to get hurt at the barn. Um, so we really need to be targeting the upper end of this um, sort of range. Um, K-State gives a number of 24 to 30 inches. Um, Kansas State does um, for cows. University of Nebraska gives 28 to 36. I would never target less than 36 inches for a cow-calf pair, if only because the calves are definitely going to try and get to the bunk as well. Um, so uh, if we really look at this right, if we look at what a cow needs 36 inches and what a feeder might need, uh, recommendations for feeders are around nine inches, we really need four times as much space at the feed bunk for a cow than we would for a feeder or a backgrounding animal. Um, so there can be a real difference in what we need uh, to provide uh, to these animals. Um, and so sometimes people will come in and try and retrofit a barn to fit uh, feeders when it was designed for cows or try and fit cows if it was designed for feeders. Um, so understanding that bunk space, uh, understanding the square footage, and understanding the water capacities, we have to decide which of these is the minimum um, component, and that's how we stock the barn. Um, and from a bunk height, I just think this is a really interesting fact, and I'm gonna come back to it on the waterer as well. For a cow to reach a bunk, 22 to 24 inches is the height. For a feeder, it's 20 to 22, and for a calf, it's 18 inches. Uh, so one of the values of putting these animals in a barn is that we can get the calves onto feed uh, and onto forage more quickly, and therefore we can potentially wean a little earlier um, because they're not going to have a lag as they get weaned because they've already really accommodated eating that forage. Um, but the challenge with that is they have to be able to reach the forage. Uh, and a lot of the bunks, especially the larger J bunks that we might be looking at to be able to fit uh, the feed for the cows, uh, have some height on them that maybe would limit whether or not the calves can get to the feeder. Um, if nothing else, at least a creep space with feed in it is necessary if we have a taller uh, bunk. Uh, some other things about consideration, um, age, size, weight, variability of cows increases the likelihood of aggression and competition. So if you don't have a consistent herd of cows, the space per cow has to be higher because they won't all line up nicely and the largest cows are gonna push smaller cows or less aggressive cows out of the way. Um, the cows definitely get more roughage than feeders, um, which means they need deeper feed bunks to accommodate the bulk. A lot of people are really interested in moving cows into a barn and still feeding them predominantly hay. Uh, and from a digestibility standpoint and the health of the cow, uh, that amount of forage is really critical. Um, sort of keep in the back of your mind here that um, uh, roughage is about a half a percent of body weight for a feeder, but we really want one and a half percent or something close to that for cows um, on a high energy diet. So when we're talking about changing between a feeder and a cow and getting the feed to fit in the bunk, we really need large bunks, or we have to look at potentially something like a dairy feeding option where you're feeding on the ground, uh, and we push up uh, that forage with the larger particles in it, um, because otherwise we end up overspilling or having to feed more times per day uh, to get that amount of forage into the bunks that we have. Um, I've seen a couple people really frustrated with bunks uh, because they're sized incorrectly uh, for the type of bulky feed that they're feeding. Um, some people are chopping it small enough that it'll fit in, uh, but if it gets chopped too small, they have the same issues as dairy farmers uh, with the digestibility uh, on that diet. So there's, it's really a sort of a challenge to make sure that that feed bunk is, is what's wanted. Um, feed rations can be used to reduce the feed costs and or limit feeding. Um, we went and visited a producer the other day and was feeding just hay, a high quality hay, and he definitely had to limit feed. He said he didn't anticipate how much less his feed cost was going to be because he had to limit feed to maintain proper body weights. Um, and certainly if you move to a ration where you have a high energy component to it, 
you really will be pretty conscientious about limiting feeds uh, in that bunk. Um, but you still want to have feed out for enough hours in the day to keep the cows from, from being destructive. So there is a sort of a balancing act uh, in feeding uh, cows in a barn. <clears throat> Those calves really can lean much earlier, but they, they desperately need access to the bunk space or to be adapted to a creep diet before uh, you lean early. Um, from the data that's out there, it looks like from a cow perspective, up to 25% reduction in feed costs is a viable option. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that when they're in the barn like this, the energy uh, needs on the diet really will change from winter to summer. So a lot of people traditionally have animals on pasture in the summer and then feeding hay in the winter. Um, if they're in a barn continuously, a lot of uh, beef producers aren't anticipating that that energy content that they need in the summer and winter are different uh, because they're not used to feeding hay both summer and winter. Uh, and they'll feed the same amount year round and then they'll get pulled down in the winter and fat in the summer. So that's something else that, that farmers need to keep sort of in mind and probably something to remind them of as they're thinking about uh, choosing a bunk and choosing uh, the type of diet they're looking at. So, uh, Water requirements. This slide really just gives basic information on how much water each type of animal will drink per day in hot and cold weather. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that traditionally our, our data on hot weather water requirements for beef cows comes from beef cows that are on pasture. Uh, so that's an animal that's already eating a grass with water in it. Um, so when we move them into the barn, we're essentially putting them onto a dry diet, which means that their water needs are going to increase. Um, so if we're looking at data from the type of watering system, a lot of times we underestimate uh, what they need. Um, so if we think we're tight on water or space, based upon uh, the recommendations from the water, the water itself, uh, we need to really look at that pretty closely. Uh, so those are just the statements that the higher the dry matter intake, the higher the water requirement. Um, the way cattle tend to drink, we want all of the water supply to be available in a four-hour window. Um, so depending on the size of the water line coming in and how fast the, the tank fills, uh, we want to make sure that all the animals can drink the capacity they need in four hours. Uh, and a water trough that's a good height for the cows is too high for the calves. Keep in mind, if we're, if we're pushing the calves uh, on the forage or on a creep feed pretty heavily because we think we're going to lean early, that we need to also have them on water. Um, because they're getting a lot of milk, uh, but anytime they're getting energy from something else, they need that water to balance it out uh, to make sure they're digesting it properly. Uh, so putting some form of a lip um, or an apron around the water tank that the calves can get their feet onto so that they can reach into the tank as well uh, is really important. This is just um, three waters, all recommended for about 200 beef. Um, when a company puts out a water and they say that they their water will will provide water for 200 beef, it means 200 feeders. Uh, it doesn't mean 200 beef cows at the capacity that that cow is at. Um, realistically, they're going to drink less water than a dairy cow. Uh, but significantly more than a beef feeder. Um, so what we're really trying to do here, especially in lactation, those cows are gonna drink more than a beef feeder. Um, so what we're really trying to do here is target a number of cows that's somewhere between that dairy number and that beef number. And if we wanna be safe, we probably should use the dairy number and not overextend that water uh, to make sure that those cows are getting the water that they need. Um, realistically, if I was looking at these waterers that say 200 beef or 100 dairy, I'm probably thinking 150 is the absolute maximum number of cows that could be on it. Uh, and I'd probably be targeting something closer to 125. Um, the other thing to note here is look at the variation in the heights on the waterers. Um, um, and then look also at the heater capacity 
uh, and the capacity of water that it's being held by the tanks. Um, so a 60 gallon tank, if we're trying to get them to drink in four hours and we have a reasonable line coming in to refill it, won't be any issue at all. Uh, on that 20 gallon tank, if we have a small line coming in and a 20 gallon tank, there's no way we can feed over 100 uh, beef cows. Uh, and a lot of people have smaller water lines traditionally run to beef um, waterers rather than the dairy tends to run larger lines a lot of times um, because they know how much uh, their animals drink. Uh, so there's sort of an interesting dynamic there. Um, but something to sort of keep in the back of the mind is that when we move these animals into a barn and onto this diet, not only are we feeding them hay year round or, or some diet with a lot of forage in it, <clears throat> but we're supplying the water to match that as well. So this is just a, a basic set of information on ventilation needs um, for cold and hot weather for cows, calves, and feeders. Um, I just put this in here uh, for two reasons. One, it's really hard to calculate ventilation rates on naturally ventilated barns. Uh, and I'm not expecting that anyone's going to do that, but the relationship between the amount of airflow that a cow needs and the amount of airflow that a calf needs is quite drastic. <clears throat> and when we go to ventilate a barn, we have to ventilate the barn for the cow, and we have to give the calf somewhere to stay where it doesn't get a lot of draft on it. <clears throat> and in the summertime, it's critical that we get the heat out uh, for the cows as well. Um, and the calves will be more than happy to take that airflow in the summertime. Um, this is sort of related to ventilation. Ventilation and flooring uh, sort of tie together pretty well. Um, dry, dusty conditions um, cause respiratory issues. Wet, muddy conditions cause poor performance and disease. The calves need the dry, de the dry bedding. Um, so we need to be ventilating for providing that dry bedding for the calves. Um, but we have to be conscious that however we're ventilating that space, what we don't want to do is create a dusty condition in the barn um, that's going to cause respiratory disease. We already have a lot of disease concerns in the barn. So what we're trying to do is move fresh air in and the dusty air out, however we're doing it, uh, stirring up dust in the space uh, in order to drive airflow down is not ideal. Um, but we need to move air across uh, the flooring to move that moisture out. Um, this was another slide about slatted floors. I apologize that it's repeated here, but it's just the spacing numbers on those slatted floors and why they're not recommended. Um, types of natural ventilation. Um, if you're looking to ventilate the barn naturally and you're trying to figure out what's going on in the space, um, buoyancy is the primary method by which we bring air in in the wintertime. Uh, when we close curtains, um, we bring in the air through the eave. That cold air comes in. It just naturally will drop because it's cold and heavy. Um, but hopefully if we're pulling it in properly, it sort of mixes before it hits the ground where the calves are laying down, uh, keeping them from getting too cold. Uh, and then that warm air that's got moisture and dust pathogens, the ammonia in it, is going to naturally rise uh, and go out through a ridge opening. Um, a lot of times I see people with um, hoop barns that are not properly designed, that don't have enough ridge opening, and they have real challenges then uh, because there's nowhere for that ammonia, that dust, to leave in the wintertime. Uh, and then they end up opening up the sidewalls, those curtains, um, and then they move so much air through that they chill animals. Um, and those animals are probably at that point slightly wet because they didn't get the moisture out of the barn. So they were laying on a wet spot. So um, there's really that sort of uh, challenge there that if we don't get that air out, we end up with a moisture issue and then we have to ventilate with uh, wind driven, which is a much higher ventilation rate. In the summertime, wind driven is probably our primary goal, we want the wind to blow and we want the barn to ventilate that way. Um, sort of the factors that affect how ventilation works is the temperature difference. The barn should be warmer than outside by about a couple degrees. If it's warmer than outside by more than say 10 or 12 degrees, 
we're probably getting not enough ventilation uh, in the space. Uh, I know with the cold weather the last couple weeks, uh, a lot of people probably would have expected a barn to stay above freezing, but it shouldn't really have been above freezing uh, with the cold temperatures we were experiencing last week. Um, the area of the inlet and the outlet will drive the ventilation rate. So if our outlet is too small or our inlet is too small, we will restrict airflow. Um, and the other thing that's important is that that ridge, that, that opening, that outlet is at the top. It has to have some amount of height difference between uh, that and where the, the eave or the inlet of that air is. Um, that higher that difference is, the faster air is going to move. It's the same concept as a chimney. So the reason that chimneys are driven above the roof line by a significant amount is because that extra height will further speed up the air as it leaves um, out, of the, out of the house or out of the stove. So um, sort of an interesting concept, but that height is really critical. Some people will put in a very uh, shallow pitched uh, gabled structure uh, and then they have issues with, and they say they have plenty of ridge opening and they might, uh, but if that uh, slope on those uh, roof lines isn't steep enough, there's not enough height difference to actually move the air quickly. Um, these are just examples of ridge vents or dual, dual eaves. Um, you can see here that a couple of the companies that are designing these hoop barns actually do a pretty nice job creating a good uh, eave opening. Um, and that's really important. Um, some of the companies don't provide that opening, and if it's not there, there's no way to move that air. Um, this is a, a gabled structure. It's got a covered ridge. It's actually not a terrible ridge for the width of this barn and the number of animals. Uh, it looks like it might be slightly narrow, but because they have the feed alley down the center of this barn, uh, their stocking density is pretty low, and their area where animals are actually experiencing um, conditions in the barn is pretty small. So. Uh, this barn does work fairly well, but that uh, covered ridge is another option. It's critical with that covered ridge that that ridge be high enough, that cover be high enough that we're not restricting airflow through the ridge. For the wind-driven uh, ventilation rates, uh, the wind direction, wind speed, and the area of the opening on the sidewalls are what controls how much air moves through a barn. Um, a lot of times in the winter around here, we can use wind driven at least part of the time. Um, and with curtains, we can actually control the amount of opening we have on the sidewalls. So rather than opening it completely or closing it completely, uh, we can open those curtains about halfway and allow some wind to come through, but maybe not draft the whole barn by leaving it wide open. Uh, this map really shows us um, wind directions across the U.S. And I bring up these maps here for to really talk a little bit about the monoslope barn and the challenge with it, um, but also to demonstrate that Kentucky, which doesn't have a lot of pictures on this map, has wind directions coming from all sorts of directions. We get a lot of southern winds, uh, but along the Ohio River and some of those areas, we get some, some northwestern winds. Uh, it depends on where you are in the state, and, and certainly the way the hills and things flow in the state. Uh, every time you go on a farm, it's, it's worthwhile to at least ask the farmer where they think the wind comes from locally, um, because it's not the same uh, everywhere. Um, with the monoslope, uh, the design is traditionally that the big open side faces south, and then the narrower end of the monoslope uh, faces north. And the purpose of that is that the smaller end uh, faces north, and in the Midwest, most of the winds uh, in the wintertime come from the north. So what happens is that wind hits that shorter wall, and then as it goes through the barn, the barn is actually expanding in area, so the wind is slowing. So any sort of air speed that the wind is, is pushing through the barn can be slowed dramatically to reduce drafts on the cat cattle. Um, and that's really effective for the wintertime when we're trying to get sort of our minimum ventilation and we're not looking to make as much airspeed as possible. But in the summertime around here, we get winds from the south predominantly, but we also still get some winds from other directions. In the Midwest, uh, all of the winds tend to come from the south in the summertime, so that wide open space um, 
that wide open tall wall uh, will push air all the way across the barn. And as that area becomes uh, tighter, the air speed's going to increase. So when in the summertime, when we're trying to get as much air speed as possible across an animal, uh, we can really do that uh, with the wind-driven system in a monoslope. Um, unfortunately, here in Kentucky, in a lot of spots where we have south winds in the summer and south winds in the winter, we are increasing our airspeed in the winter time at the same level that we're increasing it in the summertime. Uh, and that wintertime airspeed is actually too much, especially with calves in the barn. Uh, where we're already significantly overventilating for the calves, now we're really drafting on the calves uh, with that monoslope. Uh, separation between barns. Uh, this is one of the other things uh, that's really critical. There's sort of two rules of thumb for figuring out how much space needs to be, be between a barn and the next structure to stop restricting wind flow. Uh, the simpler of the two calculations is the distance between the barns is three times the height of the barn that is upwind. So the barn that's going to receive wind first, uh, the maximum height that that barn reaches times three is how much distance needs to be to the next barn. Um, I like that if only because it's very simple when you're out in the field, um, but the second equation, the one at the top, distance is 0.4 times the height times the square root of the length is another really interesting equ equation. It says if you have a really big, wide barn in front of a smaller barn, the width of that barn is also going to affect how much distance you need between the barns because it changes how air flows around the barns. Um, so if you have barns of really various sizes, um, let's say you're putting in a barn, but you have a really large machine shed in front of it that's maybe four times as large as as the uh, cow-calf barn that you're putting in, using that first equation would give you probably a more representative separation distance that you actually need. Um, so something to keep in mind. Uh, the same thing goes in the other way. If you're putting in this new barn and it's going to pick up the wind uh, and you have some other barn downwind of it, uh, it'd be good to make sure that that barn that, that's going in is not uh, going to impact the other barn that's already existing. Um, one of the issues with calves in confinement is just general disease issues, scours, navel infections, coxie. Um, in general, um, there, are, there are a couple things that go on in the barn um, that maybe create more issues on top of that disease. If there are aggressive cows, bully cows, or slow moving calves, uh, especially at feeding times, uh, calves can get it injured. Um, there are some cows that just don't do well in barns. They don't tend to, to handle the barn well, uh, or they tend to be very aggressive getting to that feed bunk, especially on a limit-fed diet, uh, and the calves don't know how to manage with that. Um, access to feed and water. Uh, if we're not getting access to feed and water for those calves, um, it is a real challenge. Um, and protection from the weather is another big issue. Uh, it's critical that we give those calves some areas where they can get out of uh, wind. Um, the other thing that a lot of people are concerned about is how they're going to calve in a barn. Um, and so there are options for calving pens. Some people are okay with calves stealing milk from every mother in the space. Other people it bothers. Um, if you want a cow-calf to be a pair, a true pair, they need to be in a calving pen for 24 to 48 hours at the very minimum in order to get those uh, cows and, and calves to bond properly. Uh, and there still will be some stealing of milk. Um, some people are not bothered by that. I personally, I think I would struggle uh, with that concept that the cows and calves could do whatever they wanted. Um, one of the concepts is to put in calving pens and say a, a push alley on the back side of the barn as a way to get those cow-calf pairs sort of split off. This is a, actually a barn design from, from Midwest Plan Service, but the concept that that might be your push alley um, and you're just putting some gates in it to create some separate pens uh, might work pretty well. It probably depends on if you're doing AI or doing some other form. If you have AI and you have 20 calves coming on one day, uh, you need a lot of pens in order to manage uh, that sort of system. So um, some people 
worry about it and other people don't, but it's something to keep in mind when, when designing a barn is whether or not that's an issue. The other thing uh, that is potentially an issue is um, uh, disease management with those calves. Typically calves get different diseases every week, up to about four weeks, uh, different types of scouring. Um, so week zero and week one calves really um, need to be together. Uh, week two calves probably need to be in a separate pen because they've already shed certain diseases um, and you don't want them providing that disease to the younger calves as they're shedding it. Uh, and the same thing with week three calves. The concept with this would be to move pregnant cows to a new area every seven or ten days so that the new calves come in on fresh bedding, uh, not on top of where the other calves already were. Uh, and when all the calves are four weeks old, they can all be commingled. Um, so certainly with an AI system where you can get pretty tight calving windows, that, that's pretty viable. Uh, for people that have a lower management style to the calving, uh, different um, concept and probably a bit more challenging. Um, but most people looking at the barn are looking at AI anyway. Uh, with the creep areas, there's a lot of different types of creep areas sort of out there. Um, and the amount of space they need is not as critical as that the space is properly bedded uh, and it's sort of protected from weather. Uh, these are all examples of um, creep areas. For whatever reason, this calf is laying uh, not in the creep area, it's laying outside of it. But uh, providing access to that alleyway um, in the back on that top left picture, that would be an area that could be considered a creep area or a push alley when you have to work cattle. Um, the other one shows a creep area sort of inside the back side of pens. Um, it's certainly an option. This is a research type facility, but it's a nice job showing a creep area, the cows, and a working facility all sort of organized together. Um, the creep area should get additional bedding above and beyond uh, what the cows are getting. A lot of times straw, which is not ideal for a bedded pack barn, is really good um, for a calf area because it provides a lot of bulk uh, that keeps the calves out of the wind. Um, it also, the creep area gives protection from uh, the cattle and calves will use creep areas. Um, as well, that's a good spot to target having some supplemental feed. Uh, this is a Kentucky producer where he has the calves with a creep area that's outside of the barn. So what he's basically doing is providing an area for the calves in a small field where the cows can't get to. They're getting creep feed there, but they're also getting uh, some, some sunlight, um, which helps with some disease issues, and uh, some fresh air. Um, so that's not a bad option. And sort of as a final thought, um, Managing a cow-calf operation in confinement is extremely labor-intensive. Um, and when there's poor management, there's a lot of negatives that come up very quickly. Um, it allows for really precise individual management for people that are really invested in their animals or trying to really improve a herd. There's a lot of benefit in the ability to, to understand what each animal is doing individually uh, and how well it's rebreeding and things like that. Um, but it's not the same as managing a feeder in confinement. So a lot of people like interchange between the two, like the concepts are similar, but they're not that, that similar. Uh, the challenge, challenge of managing cow-calf pairs in a barn is significantly uh, greater than managing a feeder in a barn. And the economics really have to be evaluated on an individual basis. It's really challenging to make the economics work. Um, if your feed costs aren't high to begin with. Um, I guess if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Any questions? Brandon?
Okay, thank you. Some order list. Yeah, we'll see. Screen capture, I guess. I got all those. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.